This is a conversation with Matt Cutler, the CEO and co-founder of Block Native. Block Native is a real-time infrastructure and monitoring tool for pre-chain data. They're helping to optimize gas spend and predict transaction settlement. Uh, Matt founded multiple technology companies previous to Block Native. Uh, we talked a bit about his transaction history uh, of large companies that he started. We dove into the details of what pre-chain data is, why you have to keep keep refreshing your screen to see if your crypto transaction went through and what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, we talked about the merge of Ethereum 2.0 and what that's going to mean for people in the short term and the long term, how the price of Ethereum might be baked into that and other implications. Uh, I learned a lot in this conversation specifically about the mempool pre uh, a pre-chain layer. Uh, Matt did a really great job of explaining all that. He mentioned a few books at the end, uh, Innovator Solution and the Breakdown Podcast, which I'm excited to check out. And without further ado, here is Matt Cutler. All right, Matt. Uh, I was excited to do a bunch of research on you and your different companies before diving in and Block Native, uh, and we were saying pre-show about the sweet swag you guys have. So I love the logo and thank your team for the shirt and hat that you sent over. I really appreciate that. Um, let's start with Block Native. Well, actually, let, before we touch Block Native, uh, I, you have built, sold, gone public with. Uh, merged uh, a number of different companies. It sounded like from from my research on it, uh, Collaborate.com to WebEx was a big one. And then you started a company, a few others. Um, NetGenesis was a big, big project. How do you think of the size, scope, challenge, learning experience if you were to stack rank the different uh, non-block native companies that you've been a part of? Wh which have, have you learned the most from? Oh, that's an interesting one. So, so first off, great to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity to share some of those perspectives. I'm, I'm Matt. I'm founder and CEO of Block Native, and uh, I like to say I've been around the block a few times. Depending on how you count, I've done like seven or eight startups. Uh, my very first startup was uh, a Web 1.0 infrastructure provider called uh, NetGenesis. Uh, that I created, I founded that in 1994, which dates me a little bit. But I was an undergrad at MIT at the time, so this is long before it was fashionable to do uh, startups as an undergrad, long before it was fashionable to do internet companies, uh, we built that. Uh, that one was a nine-year overnight success, uh, zero to IPO. And at the time we went public was one of the top 35 IPOs in history, which is a little crazy to think about. Um, wow. Since been surpassed many times over. Don't worry about that at all. Um, and, and you know, I was sort of had a front row seat and was quite frankly part of, you know, the world going from, offline to online. And today we live in an offline an online reality. And, you know, when I was even in college, that wasn't necessarily the case. But because I happen to be at MIT, I happen to have sort of advanced access to a lot of internet infrastructure and sort of realize this way the world was going to go. Uh, my most recent startup prior to Block Native was called Collaborate.com, which was a mobile collaboration platform founded in, it must have been 2011, on the radical idea that people would do work on their phones, which at the time yeah. was crazy. Like, Phones were for games, phone were for maybe a little bit of social, but laptops were for work. And now it seems sort of quaint about that. We wound up selling that uh, to Cisco, which was a great deal. And in terms of that deal where me and my whole team moved from the Boston area to the Bay Area, and that's why I live here right now. In between, I did a whole bunch of stuff in ad tech and mobile 1.0. And, and I would say, you know, I learned the most from the ones that weren't successful. Not all of them wound up successful. I like to say, you know, split them, merge them, shut them down, you know, put them together. And uh, one of the things that I've learned in building software, so most of everything I've done is software, is uh, you don't really know what you have until you bring it to market. And, and generally what you're hoping for is a big hit. I've never had any sort of giant hits. But you get something out and some small segment of users say, wow, this is super interesting. We really love this. But the reasons why they love it may be quite different than why you built it or what you thought was interesting. And my successful startups were those that listened to those early users and said, this part's really interesting and, and this is what we're excited about and sort of leaned into that. And my startups that were not successful were those that ignored that feedback. And so mm -hmm. I learned that lesson a couple of times the hard way. And now I've learned to be very attuned to what end users, what customers find useful and and then go after that as aggressively as possible. And we're really lucky to be able to do that here at Block Native. 
Mm. Yeah, I find it is in my experience, uh, which I, I will say you started and studied in mechanical engineering, right? Correct. At MIT. How did you know at that time you wanted to not continue with that pursuit and instead switch over to CS? Because my background was in mechanical engineering, and then I jumped right into starting a software company as well. But I'm curious oh, wow. what you're. That's awesome. So yeah. it's funny. I went. I, I went to MIT in the '90s. I was really interested in design, and at, at that point, MIT did not have a design program. Um, and, and I was sort of interested in industrial design. And what I kind of figured out as I was going in was industrial design is the the uh, the casing of the vacuum cleaner and mechanical design is how the vacuum cleaner actually works. And I was much more interested in mechanical design. So that was a pretty interesting process. But uh, when we got to school, so I'm a freshman, all over campus are these computers. They're called the Athena clusters. There's a network. They're all over. And I happen to live in a fraternity across the river in Boston. And we were one of the few fraternities that had an Athena cluster in our house. So on the, the top of the building, there was a bunch of Unix workstations. And everywhere that you went, you had access to them. They were all interconnected. They're connected to other schools. You could send messages. Your schoolwork was there. And it just sort of was like, this is how things are at MIT. We later learned like, oh, this is the internet. And uh, uh, not everybody has access to it. In fact, MIT had a class A subnet, which is, you know, 18 dot is MIT. And, mm -hmm. you know, high speed Unix workstations, high speed networking. And, and we didn't really quite appreciate it, but we were living in the future. Like just, we, we enjoyed this online interconnected reality that just very few people had access to. And once you sort of lived in that for a few years, you realize like, this is the way it's going to be. It's just so much better than the alternatives. And, you know, I think the idea was I could go work for another company. I could go, you know, take a job at any one of the number of entities that recruit heavily at MIT, or we could try to build the future in the internet, right? And so um, it didn't, I didn't think about it all that much. It just seemed like a much more exciting, much more interesting opportunity to go, you know, try to build something from scratch in this net new area. And it's easy to romanticize what it must have been like to build internet technology in the early and mid 90s, but it was pretty lonely. Um, mm -hmm. Most people didn't know about it. Most people thought it was weird and crazy. And the prevailing wisdom was that something like AOL would, would, would win, right? Um, and so it was a slog. It was a, a lot of work over many years, right? It, it wasn't an overnight success by any means. Um, but ultimately, we believed in the product. We believed in the direction and that proved to be you know, pivotal. And I feel very much the same way about Web3 is once I started to pay attention, my reaction was, oh, I've seen this movie before, right? It's early, it's weird, it's hard to use, the technology is really difficult to understand, but it's so much better than the alternative. And hey, I get advanced access to what the future is going to be. And it seems sort of inevitable that this is the direction everything's going to go in. Left Cisco, start a new infrastructure company, all focused on accelerating Web3. Mm. Yeah, your intuition is right, uh, for sure. It, it seems like the, the foundational insight you had in both uh, like web nothing to web one and then web, web two to three is uh, that connectivity is exponential. So the, the, it, that, that, that was at least my takeaway from uh, when I think of like software compared to hardware is the ability to exponentially offer what you're creating to more people exponentially faster and then more cheaper. It's like ultimately designing a piece of hardware or designing a piece of so software is not that different. You know, you often design hardware on CAD software or design software in like a, a terminal or you know, some uh, text editor. But then the ability to distribute it is just massively different. So I, yeah, needless to say. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so I, I talk a lot about, you know, people misunderstood the internet in the early formative stages because they didn't really appreciate that the internet made content programmable and the cost of distribution zero. Okay. And it turns out when you do those two things together, it, it creates an infinite amount of expressivity and creates room for sort of infinite demand. Right. And I think very much the same is true of Web3, where you take value and you make it programmable and you reduce the cost of distribution to effectively nothing. And therefore, mm. you have huge amounts of expressivity that become enabled. And, and that level of expressivity is a lot harder to achieve when you're moving atoms around versus moving bits around, thanks to the underlying technologies of the internet. Yeah. What was the early brainstorming iteration process to dial in on precisely the, the value offering at Block Native? Was there brainstorming whiteboarding sessions with your co-founders or what sort of was like, was, was that like? 
It's very much, it's a great question. And it's very much my entrepreneurial experience. So believe it or not, Block Native started with a different name, with a different focus. Way back in 2018, believe it or not, NFT games. Okay, this was mm. sort of shortly in the aftermath of the original CryptoKitties launch, and there was a, a, a bunch of interest in building sort of collectible games and things like that. Well, this is sort of my entrepreneurial uh, uh, experience in a nutshell. We built this game. So I, I joined. It was actually a team that was already working. We got it funded. I joined as CEO. And we had smart contracts written. We had, you know, front end DAP written. And uh, at Cisco, I had led the global design thinking transformation. I wrote a book. I built labs. There's a whole interesting process there. And as a result of that, I'm a big believer in user testing. And so we have this game. Um, it's functional. It's getting ready to go. Uh, I joined the team. I'm getting up to speed. I said, well, let's do some user testing. We user test this game, and, and it is without question the worst user testing I've ever seen by a country mile. Like, it is hmm. absolutely terrible. And I, of course, am mortified, right? I'm joined this thing, doing it. Like, it's just unusable. And, and I come back to the team with the, the feedback, and, and the re reaction really surprised me. They said, oh, none of that's us. That's, that's not us. That's Ethereum. That's MetaMask. That's just how it is, right? And, and I said, look, we're never going to get anywhere if people can't use this thing. And so the idea was it's sort of a crypto collectible game associated with influencers. And it's going to be broad audience and blah, blah, blah. And like, it's just not going to happen if it's too hard to use. The team said, well, we can't do anything about it. Said, could we write some code to help out? Oh, well, that's interesting. Let's see what we could do. And the team spent just a couple of weeks um, building some little widgets one widget basically detected if you had a wallet, which at that point was only MetaMask. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have a wallet, it, it instructed you how to get one and get it configured so you could transact. And then we were doing, it was just all on the Rinkeby testnet at the time, but whenever you did a transaction on Ethernet, it was full of, I'm sorry, on, on, um, uh, on MetaMask, it was full of all these ghost clicks. Like you'd press a button and something would happen, but you get no feedback. And so we had these little pop-ups that would basically tell you what was going on with your transactions, okay? So we go back out. New user testing, much better. So, okay, great. You know, we've made progress. Awesome. And I start to get up to speed, meet more people in the industry, start to share with them what we're building. I think I had like five or six meetings in a row that went like this. This game you're building? Okay. But those widgets, those are super cool. Could, mm -hmm. could you generalize that? Could you make one of those for us? And it was at that point that I started to realize like, oh, there's no tooling for developers. The usability is terrible. And there's a bunch of unmet need for this class of infrastructure. And so we pivoted the organization from doing NFT-based games, which for a long time seems like a really smart thing. And then there was a short period where that might have been, you know, really lucrative, so et cetera. But, um, you know, we really focused on infrastructure tooling experience. And that really changed the trajectory of the business. We got a lot more traction that way. We got a lot more, you know, hands-on user experience. We got a lot more feedback and we just continued to listen on to that. And through that journey, what we discovered and what we understood was the pre-chain layer. So all the data, all of the stuff that involves a transaction between the time that it's an idea and it goes on chain is a big gap that it, there's, it's really hard to work with, it's really hard to capture, it's really hard to make sense of, but it very much determines outcomes and settlements, determines user experience, and that, that's just a big gap in the ecosystem. And so we increasingly focused on that and building real-time infrastructure to capture, normalize, and enrich the pre-chain layer. And it's been sort of off to the races ever since. And you know, for a while, people thought we were doing some pretty crazy esoteric work, and now it's like, you're right in the center of all the action and right when and some of the most important stuff happening across all of Web3. So that's super fun, but you know, it takes a long time to build and it's been quite a journey along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I find that that's, that's usually or often how it goes is you start off with one concept, uh, Slack comes to mind because they were also working on games and then the, the game didn't go anywhere. But hey, by the way, we're building this IRC tool and oh, let's, let's spin that out and that becomes Slack. Yep. Uh, yeah, which is parallels your journey. I'd love to learn a little bit more about this um, like pre-chain layer. So I, I think the the chain layer, the miners, the validator, the validating process. Um, most people have a, a like a gray cloud understanding, meaning that that they understand there's miners, they understand they make money, they have servers, pe that people are solving complex problems, getting paid for it when new blocks are released. Uh, mind. Um, the pre-chain layer to me is more mysterious and how 
that pro how the validators parse out can you explain this to me like first like i'm 12 uh sure. <laughs> and, and then <laughs> i'll ask you if i have any questions about it oh sure of course and and you're not alone in this that that the the how things really work is uh, not very well understood across the ecosystem um, is a lot different than what people expect and actually really sort of fundamental. So, so happy to dive in here. So first off, public blockchain network, right? Any public blockchain network means that you can use it in the public. So anyone can submit a transaction at any time. The network needs to reach consensus, right? It needs to agree on which transactions it's going to be, are going to be included. So by definition, public blockchain network needs a pre-chain layer, which is the area where transactions go to be considered as candidates for inclusion. Now, if you could just write directly to the chain, you would not have a blockchain at all. You'd have a database, right? Mm -hmm. Just write to it. And so a pre-chain layer is necessary, a necessary precondition for consensus. Now, typically this is known as the mempool. So on Bitcoin and Ethereum, you have the mempool, but there are other forms of public blockchain networks that have other constructions and they say, oh, we don't have a mempool, we do something else, but it doesn't matter. You have some area where transactions go to be candidates for inclusion. Okay, that's a fact. Um, for general users, I often say, you know, you've had that experience where you submit a transaction, you wait for a while, and then it, mm. you know, confirms or fails. I say, ever think about what happens when you're waiting? No, not really. Turns out all these interesting things. Okay, so what's actually occurring? So each, so blockchain by definition, moves forward in blocks like a watch click 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 in the case of ethereum it moves forward about every 13 and a half seconds post merge will be every 12 seconds okay each one of those blocks consists of a, a of a series of transactions so on ethereum today it's between 125 and maybe 250 transactions per block in order so when you submit a transaction you're competing with all the other transactions in the world to be one of the the ones included in the block Okay. And it turns out that it's a pretty difficult competition because at any given time, there's anywhere from maybe 80,000 to 300,000 pending transactions that are waiting or trying to be one of the top couple hundred to be included in a block. Okay. And, and the way that the price to be included in a block is expressed is in gas, is a transaction mm -hmm. fees, right? So as there's more demand on the network, as more people are trying to get transactions in and get settled, it gets more crowded, price goes up, you pay more to get a transaction. Similarly, there's less competition, there's less going on, there's less demand, price goes down, gas goes down, right? So that's sort of the mechanic of it all. But underneath the covers, there are what are called miners who do two really important jobs and only one of which is really even partially understood. Miners do two things. They create block templates, which is these transactions are going to be in a block in the sequence and then they try to solve proof of work, solve for, you know, solve a series of esoteric math problems to try to win the block out of all the other people doing the same thing. But it's actually even a little more subtle than this because the, the days of the independent miner where you would have a machine underneath your desk and you could successfully mine blocks have long since gone because it's too lucrative. And today, most of the network works on what are called mining pools. Mining pools are, you might have a bunch of, mm. of computers that you wanna to devote to mining blocks and you join up with others in a pool and then you share the rewards and the results across the pool. And the benefit to this is it normalizes your revenue. So you, you basically participate in the winnings of the pool as a percentage of the hash power that you devote, okay? And what's significant about this is on Ethereum today, there are five mining pools which account for 65% of the hash power, okay? So a relative, a very small number of pools control most of the hash power, the majority of the hash power, and only the mining pool operators set block templates. So literally on Ethereum today, there's like five entities that you have no visibility into with no transparency who decide the contents of the next block. Huh. They determine what the block template's going to be, and then they farm it out to all the computer operators in their pool, and then they work on the problem to solve it, okay? And, and this is not great for all the reasons you might expect, because it turns out that being in that position of privilege, being at the head of the chain, and being able to determine which transactions are included or maybe excluded, and the sequence of that is quite valuable, okay? And what's significant, and the reason why I raise this, so this is how it works today. So you have... Transactions that go into the mempool, okay? They compete with all the other transactions. The mining pool operators skim off the top, 
Maybe they play some other games on the side using things like MEV, right? To reorder things a little bit or add in some transactions. They farm it out to their proof of work miners and they churn on math problems. They burn energy to devote to CPU cycles to prove the work that they have done because it's uh, you can't fake it. There's no way to sort of magically do that. And then, hey, you win a block. You get a reward for winning a block. And those transactions, that block then gets inspected by everybody else in the network. If it is validated, it becomes the head of the chain. And hocus pocus, your pending transaction now is confirmed and becomes truth. Okay, That block then gets cryptographically intertwined with the subsequent blocks and becomes impossible to unwind. Okay, That's sort of the nature mm-hmm. of these things. With Ethereum and with other chains today, they're moving to a different model called proof of stake, which doesn't do the computation side of things. It basically uses a um, game theoretic model where you stake or basically put up value and you basically commit to tell the truth. And if you tell the truth, you can you get rewarded. And if you don't tell the truth, you get slashed or you lose some of what you put up. Now, with Ethereum, this move to proof of stake is now known as the merge. It was previously known as Ethereum 2.0. And it's coming, the expectation is before the end of the year. Um, We're moving quite closely to it. But it changes a lot of how this stuff works and makes the, the infrastructure of the blockchain much more modular. And in particular, what it's going to do is democratize block building. So now, as opposed to a few set of actors who are responsible for setting these block templates and deciding what's going to go in, it's an open marketplace where anybody can do that. And uh, that's a super exciting uh, upgrade. So we went pretty far down this mm. rabbit hole, but it's it's there's a lot of inner workings to all of this. And what we do at Block Native is we have a global data network that in that basically captures all this data and makes it available for people to inspect, to to drive value from, and to predict what's going to happen next. And so if you think about the transactions that go on chain as the truth, the future of all truth is in a the pre-chain layer, in a mempool somewhere, right? And so if you can have full visibility into what's going on globally on the network, you can have visibility into the future of truth, what transactions are going to occur next. And it turns out that's a very powerful and very valuable capability that we think everybody needs to have access to. And so what we build at Block Native is infrastructure for everyone to use to be able to work with and manipulate pre-chain data in the ways that the most sophisticated actors in the networks can do today. Hmm. And so are you looking at what transactions are accepted by the validators and sort of reverse engineering the algorithm or the method through which the validators are accepting transactions as the way to gather the data that you're getting or how, 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 if that's not right, how do you get the data? Sure. So we see as close to 100% of the public mempool as is statistically possible. Okay. So, uh, and how we do this is quite sophisticated and it's a fairly large amount of infrastructure that's fairly expensive to build and operate as you might expect. So step one is see all the transactions, right? Mm -hmm. Step two is once you can see all those transactions in as close to real time as possible. So not only do you have a big real time data footprint, but it's got very high speed properties so you can move the data around inside of it quite quickly. If you see everything, we're then able to build models that say, well, based on everything that we see, here's what's likely to be in the next block. And here's the likely sequence of those transactions, right? Hmm. So one of the things that we do on top of this sort of data infrastructure is gas estimation. And and we operate what's widely regarded as the most accurate gas estimator in the Ethereum ecosystem. We recently added uh, the same to the Polygon ecosystem. You can access this, by the way, for free at gas.blocknative.com. You can also download uh, our browser extension for Chrome, Brave, and Firefox. Um, And we have APIs for this as well for developers and traders. And what we're doing there is we're predicting the contents of the next block. Actually, we predict the contents of the next five blocks. And we say, based on what's likely to be in the next block, here are the transaction fees or gas prices being paid. And so if you want to get into the next block, here's how you need to price your transaction in order to be sure you're included. And so these are real-time ML models using AI, Mm -hmm. and they update themselves every second. So every second, we're recalculating what the likely contents of the next several blocks are going to be. And then we uh, uh, produce results that say, hey, if you want to get in, here's what you need to do. And it's particularly useful at during periods of network congestion, like say a big NFT drop is happening. 
and you want to make sure you get in and whatever your browser, whatever your wallet is telling you is probably too low because the network congestion is spiking, gas prices are spiking. And unless you're really on top of all this data with really sophisticated modeling, you're probably behind the power curve, right? Our models are tuned to, to basically understand these scenarios really well. And so our gas estimator is widely relied on members of that ecosystem to make sure that they get predictable performance and settlement during period when, when, when things really matter, right? And that's why we, we build that, right? We do other things like transaction simulation. So you could give us a, a thing you're thinking about and we say, if you were to submit this transaction right now, here's what would happen. Here's all the balance changes. Mm -hmm. um, we do that with the entire mempool. So we look at all transactions and we say, here's what all these different transactions are trying to do. So therefore you can understand, is this an attack? Like, is this some sort of anomaly? Or is this some big trade that's gonna move the price on some liquidity pool that's gonna create an arbitrage opportunity that you can get behind? So there's many uses of, of this class of data um, and this class of infrastructure. But again, it's not the sort of thing that your average user is gonna build on their own. It's not the sort of data that your average user is well configured to, to sort of make sense of on their own. And so we provide front end tooling to make this really easy to work with. We have a the only mempool explorer in the category. You can get to that at explore.blocknative.com. And literally you can put in any arbitrary smart contract or wallet address. And anytime a new transaction hits the mempool, you'll get events right there in your browser. Click, 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 and you can get it right in your Slack. So one of the things we always recommend to people is go to Mempool Explorer, connect your wallet, connect it to Slack, and you'll get messages every single time you have a, a transaction exiting or entering your wallet. And it's just amazing how it reduces transaction anxiety. So mm. you know that nothing weird is happening with your wallet, and you know that when you're trying to get something done, you can see in real time what exactly is happening. So anyways, there's a whole bunch of really interesting things you can do with that, and, and that's why it's super fun to – to be doing yeah. what we're doing for the ecosystem, and and the, the, is the the data pipeline that you're you're feeding into is that j just after the validators will confirm on chain, or is it are you actually scraping data in the mempool prior to transactions being uh, on chain? So, very good Perfect. question. Critically, this is all before. So, okay, we're looking at the mempool. And we're looking for any change in state in the mempool, okay? Mm -hmm. So anytime anything enters the mempool, so a new transaction hits, or an existing transaction in the mempool changes state from pending to confirmed or from pending to replaced or from pending to failed, we have real-time infrastructure which detects that event, which captures it, which normalizes it, and which um, and then enriches it, right? Makes sense of it. So you don't need to tell us in advance, like I care about these addresses. Like we see all the addresses. You don't need to tell us I care about these transactions, these smart contracts. Like the whole idea is it's it's a global data platform that that has what we call census level capture of everything. So if you go to explore.blocknative.com, we have a bunch of quick start things and you can click on one that's like watch top DEXs for pending transactions. Mm. You click one button and you'll see Uniswap V2, Balancer, One Inch, and Sushi, all the pending transactions in real time. Okay. Mm. And it goes by really yeah. quickly as you might expect because there's a lot of transaction volume there. And so uh, it's, it's fascinating. And, and like another way I used to describe this is Imagine you could see every credit card transaction in the world at the moment of swipe. So even before it was confirmed mm. and you can make sense of this, like, Hey, I'll create a feed of every fitness transaction of greater than $2,000. Okay. And then you could basically package that feed up to an entity for an entity like, I don't know, Peloton. Okay. And so they can have real time visibility into every transact credit card transaction around these sorts of things. And then they could use that to inform their business. Right. Well, this is the same as true for what we do in Web3. But instead of credit card swipes, it's Web3 transactions. And instead of like uh, retail fitness, it's basically finance and DeFi and NFT transactions. And so it's really powerful uh, what can be done here, but is a little abstract and, and requires a fair amount of of hands-on experience and which is why we build the tools that we build so people can go ahead and do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Uh, so, so when someone's broadcasting a transaction request and they have a gas fee attached to that, th this mempool layer, where is this, 
where is this where is the data actually flowing to uh is it a yeah it's, you talk about that a little or so like it would make sense to me yeah. to understand that i mean visa mastercard i can understand the swipe and like okay that goes through the wire to the acquiring bank and so on but yeah how is that how do you sure. feed into this Sure. So very good question. So, okay, you might have heard about what's known as the peer to peer layer mm -hmm. in um, these Web3 systems. So, okay, uh, any block, any L1 blockchain network consists of a series of nodes. Okay. And so, in the case of Bitcoin, it's, I don't know, 10 or 12,000 nodes. In the case of Ethereum, it's probably six to 8,000, maybe a little bit more. These are individual computers that um, basically comprise the network. These these computers, the nodes in the network communicate with each other over what's known as the peer to peer layer. OK, they trade messages about transactions and blocks, and then they propagate through the network through this peer to peer level. It's not point to point. It's like a mesh of things that go along. So here you are, Mr. DeFi transactor or Mrs. NFT collector, and you have a transaction that you want to get on the chain. OK, it's on your computer. You're composing it in your wallet. Maybe use MetaMask, maybe use Ledger, maybe use something else. Um, and you're trying to submit it to the network. Well, it's got to get inserted into a node on the network. Okay. Now, some people who are sophisticated might run their own node and they configure their wallet to talk to their node. So their wallet talks to the node underneath their desk. They have a transaction, give it to the node, nodes ins inspects it, makes sure it's valid. And if it does, it then broadcasts it to its peers over the peer to peer network. A typical default, by the way, is each peer uh, has about 50 other peers. And so your computer takes it, your node gets it, mm. and it shares it with 50 of its friends. And they inspect it and they share it with 50 of its friends and 50 of its friends. And it's a cascade that goes through the network. But of course, most users don't operate their own node because it's work to do. And they use a gateway service uh, typically provided by their wallet. So if you're using MetaMask, behind MetaMask is a service called Infura. Mm. Both of these, by the way, are provided by consensus. So your MetaMask wallet, when you submit a transaction, by default submits that, if you're using Ethereum, to Infura. And fear is like AWS for this sort of stuff. It's a third party system mm -hmm. that does all the things that we just said. So they have gateway nodes and in fear a node inspects your transaction. If it's valid, it puts it in its mempool. It broadcasts it out to its peers and so on and so forth. It, it propagates to the network. Now, ultimately, as it's propag propagated through the network, it reaches a mining pool because it turns out those are the ones that really matter if you're trying to get on chain. And so the truth is, is that the peer to peer layer is relatively efficient, like a transaction will be transmitted globally. It will be present in the global mempool in anywhere from half a second to two seconds overall. But if you're doing certain DeFi stuff, if things are certain, you know, that that may not be fast enough. So there's uh, possibilities and solutions for going faster and getting straight to miners. And there's technology around that. But this basic idea is you get your transaction into a mempool on a node. It then shares it with its peers. They inspect it. They propagate it along and it cascades through the network. Now, what's interesting is every node has its own unique mempool and there is no consensus because consensus hasn't been formed yet. Mm -hmm. And so these mempools, each node has its own unique copy of transactions. And, and node A and node B and node C may have slightly different transactions in their mempool or they may have wildly different transactions in their mempool depending on how they're configured, how much resources they have, and depending on how congested the network is. And so this is one of the things that makes it hard. You can have your own node you could have tools that look at your own local mempool, but you don't really know if you're seeing everything. You don't really know how, how you know, what you're missing, what else is going on, you know, what's happening on the other side of the world because you may or may not be peered with, with uh, nodes over there. And so this is part of what makes this such an interesting and weird problem is there is no truth. Mm -hmm. Right. And depending on where you ask the network or what, what you're looking at, you can get different results. By the way, your single transaction may be in multiple states simultaneously in the mempool. And if you ask over here, it's pending. If you asked over here, it's dropped. If you asked over here, it doesn't exist, right? And so uh, it gets a little, you know, you got to think in sort of a different way to start to make sense and extract value from mempool data. Mm. Yeah, boy, it's not that dissimilar from, it just makes me think of how uh, knowledge and information or, or news is transmitted in the network of consciousness. Like if, if you tell me something and it, I, I go on and tell my wife and friends, like it gets, it gets put out there. Uh, then there's like centralized nodes, which would be maybe like uh, popular YouTube channels or TV stations, but they're never hitting everybody. I mean, it, just in the same way that no 
single mempool or node is going to have all the uh, transactions. But then all of this chit chat, this like pre-chain uh, mempool transaction data uh, become solidified in the same way, say like, um, you know, politicians talk about ideas, but at the end of the day, like what becomes a law and there's only one right. law it's canonical and it's uh, yeah, it's interesting in that way, which makes me feel like it's very, not our political system, but the <laughs> Ethereum chain, it feels like it's very efficient. Do you see, so just recapping numbers here. So roughly, uh, 8,000 nodes on the Ethereum network, um, 12,000 ish on Bitcoin, roughly five or six uh, validator miners control 65% of the Ethereum network. Um, that those all, yeah, sound right. So yeah, one, one thing. And so the number of nodes in the network sort of fluctuates mm -hmm. based on the price of the asset, the price of computers, things like that. There are resources out there to look at this, but those are gesturally correct. Now, um, uh, today, uh, Ethereum uses what's known as proof of work. And so the miners are dominated what are known as mining pools, okay? And, and those mining pools, yeah, there's a handful that, that have 65% of the hash rate. Validators are something else entirely. So validators are what you use when you have proof of stake. And so it's sort of mm -hmm. a different idea with different mechanics. And, and one of the core objectives of the merge, sort of the next generation of Ethereum, is to ensure that anyone can be a validator, that you don't need special hardware, special internet connection, big CPU, big storage, big RAM. And it turns out that's a pretty hard problem to do, um, to, to have all the characteristics of an open network, which is scalable, which is secure, which is um, resilient, but also have really minimal compute requirements to encourage participation and decentralization. And so there are many chains out there today. We work with, with a bunch more that besides Ethereum and Bitcoin. And, and oftentimes other chains will promote the fact that they're faster or they have um, lower fees. But generally what they're doing is they're just making different trade-offs. And the easiest trade-off to make is they're more centralized, right? Hey, instead of thousands of computers, there's a dozen validators, right? And those validators are operated by big, sophisticated organizations who devote really significant resources to operating and maintaining that. And therefore, like, there's sort of a small number of actors who really drive the network. Those small number of actors may have better information about what's going on in the network than anybody else does. And this creates information asymmetries which creates the conditions for haves and have nots, which creates the conditions for inequity, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we think a lot about at Block Native is leveling the playing field, just ensuring that everybody has the same information, same data. And the chains that we work with really think that's important as well. Um, I often make the analogy of if, if you don't have access to pre-chain data, it's like playing soccer or basketball against a team that can see five seconds into the future. It'd be pretty frustrating because you'd never touch the ball. <laughs> they would always know where the ball is, right? And that's the current state of the art in many of these Web3 systems is like there's folks who know what's going to happen next and everybody else who doesn't. And guess what? They, they take advantage of that. And so that's one of the big reasons why we exist as a project and, and why we're really passionate about what we do is we think this is important stuff for the, the broad health of the ecosystem. And it's in users' best interest to, to be aware and be capable with this stuff. Yeah, it sure is. So Ethereum 2, the merge, uh, what's most important? Like when you think about... The, something of this magnitude, all sorts of things comes to mind, like the technical challenges, the risks inherent moving for proof of work to stake, uh, any sort of other, I mean, there's other considerations. What do you think of as like from a retail consumer perspective that's using Ethereum, maybe they're benefiting from the dApps that are out there. Uh, what's, what's important to know or think about and pay attention to during this like pre-merge to merge process? So uh, there's a lot, it's, yeah. very, it's super, it's a fascinating topic, but so, so on a macro level, right? I was a part of the world going from offline to online. It took about 20, 25 years to happen. Um, and by the way, at the beginning, like there was no way the early internet could support YouTube or Netflix. Right. There just was not enough bandwidth. There was not enough infrastructure. The compute power wasn't there. The standards weren't there. The software wasn't there. And yet today, here we are, right? We don't think twice about, you know, streaming a 4K movie because there's a whole lot of plumbing that happened to make that possible and a whole lot of innovation that happened. Well, right now in 2022, we're in the beginning of the transition from off-chain to on-chain, 
okay? That there is a huge volume of transactions that occur every single second all over the world. And the vast majority of these, in fact, almost for all intents and purposes, all of them are off-chain transactions. And, and I believe without any question that the vast majority of transactions in the future will be on-chain because it's more efficient and more transparent and there's a huge amount of advantage associated with doing so. But just like the early stages of the internet could not support that future, the future state we have today, the, the Web3 reality, the infrastructure can't support the on-chain future. It needs to grow and needs to scale. And so the merge for Ethereum is the foundation for the future requirements of the network to enable scalability, throughput, uh, fee reduction, right? So it's, it's kind of the, the low level architecture that will enable the next generation of growth for Web3. That's the most important thing to know that this is all about setting us up for future growth and success. That's thing one. Um, thing two is if everything goes according to plan for most members of the network, they won't notice any change, right? The depths they had before will work before the wallets they had will work. The transactions will be the same. They'll be very, it'll be very subtle. The mm. changes immediately post merge, like, by the way, blocks will go from being a variable uh, uh, time to being exactly 12 seconds. So you'll, you might notice that, that there's a bit more regularity with that. Um, but otherwise, you shouldn't notice too, too much. There won't be any change in transaction volume and throughput. There won't be any change in um, fees. But underneath the covers, things are changing a lot. And so as we approach the merge, um, there is some question as what miners are going to do. So there might be some new forms of exploits and attacks. So there might be some weird behavior or some bad behavior that starts to emerge as entities that have invested very heavily in computing for mining, there's an expiration date on them and things that they previously would have considered to be not smart to do because it's against their long-term interest suddenly becomes perhaps interesting to explore because they have a, an expiration date on their infrastructure. So that's something to mm. pay attention to. Um, and then furthermore, you know, the big thing about the merge is the, the chain gets modular and it's sort of, it's subtle, but basically a lot of the things that are monolithic today and how the chain works get broken apart into now specific actors can do things like block building. Um, specific actors can do things like focus on, on data storage and data availability. And what that does is one, enable future growth and enable future scalability and, and make things cheaper. But two, it creates all sorts of new opportunity. And so we believe that the merge will represent like a new Genesis block. Now, now of course, the definition of the merge is the old chain state carries forward, they come together. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to be zero balance, but, but it's almost like a whole new ball game. And, and that there'll be a lot of opportunity for existing um, providers, existing developers in the category and existing traders to, to have new sort of ways to create and collect value post-merge that don't exist today. And um, there'll be entirely new providers that get created that, that exist because of some of the things that are happening with the merge that couldn't exist today. So it's an exciting time of transition. It's an exciting time of possibility. There is, of course, risk associated with it because, you know, th there's no way to create value without adding risk to the equation. Um, but that ultimately, I'm pretty confident that it will be, first, relatively transparent to most end users. Second, constructive for the Ethereum ecosystem and therefore value additive to the underlying asset of Ether itself. I'm not saying I expect number go up or anything like that. I am saying that successful completion of the merge will make Ethereum a more valuable chain, not a less valuable chain. And if markets are rational, that should accrue to the, the value of Ether itself, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, down the line, okay, uh, six months after the merge, a year after the merge, two years after the merge, Users will notice a faster chain. Users will notice a cheaper chain. Users will notice experiences that were previously pretty clunky or are now a whole lot smoother. Users may notice things that we're working on, like imagine instead of you paying your wallet to get a transaction on chain with gas, that your wallet pays you, that you, you actually, for doing certain things on the network, they say, hey, there's value that's being created as a result of the transaction you're contemplating, do you want to participate in that value? And so we, we believe that, that today all of the value in the network sort of flows up to the miners. Um, and tomorrow that value will be distributed in new and different ways, including to end users, 
to dApps, to wallets, to protocols, and in a much more egalitarian and we believe equitable fashion. And it will be really beneficial to to the builders and to the participants in that. So mm. this is the world that's coming, but it's going to take a few clicks for us to get there. Yeah, and it, it seems like it had been getting pushed back consistently, which was a, a source of some internal agitation among the community. Uh, a couple of, a couple of questions for you to bounce back. You mentioned there, that there won't be zero balance earlier. What did you mean by that? So the definition of the merge is, so you have the existing Ethereum chain, Ethereum 1.0, and, and all the balances. So mm -hmm. you have a wallet that has some stuff in it. I have some wallet that has some stuff in it. Well, so the, the merge, Ethereum 2.0, is sort of a whole new thing. But what's going to happen is all of the transactions, all of the balances that are currently on ETH1 are going to basically get combined into ETH2, into the merge. And so what I mean is it's not like a, a, a genesis block where the chain, there's no balances, there's no allocation, there's nothing like right. a, an empty chain. Okay, At the merge, it will not be empty at all. It will have the entire um, transaction state and transaction history of all of Ethereum going back to, to the beginning. So when I say Genesis block, I don't mean like a zero block. Right. I mean like uh, it's a new, a whole new game, a whole new reality, a whole new set of circumstances with all of the existing balances carrying over from the existing chain. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember when I had a, I had a Coinbase account with uh, I forget how much Bitcoin I had in there, maybe like a thousand, a little over a thousand at the time. And uh, that's when Bitcoin forked into Bitcoin Cash. And at the time, yep. I didn't really see it coming or quite understand it. But then it's like, oh, here's another wallet that has the same amount. So you just doubled your money. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine how many people saw that coming and just knew, you know, the, like, is there... In hindsight, that's obvious to have had more Bitcoin at the point when there was a fork into Bitcoin Cash. Uh, yep. Are there things that will be obvious post-merge that people should have done? Or uh, you mentioned opportunities. You, uh, uh, what was I going to say? The um, uh, mer. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, Oh God, I was so interested in that. So there's a after the merge, there's an opportunity. Um, oh, man, so what happens there? Like it's it, so again, if if the merge goes according to plan, for most participants in the network, you won't see any change. Oh, if you had it before, we'll carry over. Sorry, go. Yeah, I was gonna, sorry to interrupt you. I was gonna. Wh why would it take uh, six months plus for people to recognize the difference in transaction speed? That's what I was curious oh, about. Because the merge, so so the biggest thing is the merge is sort of foundational architecture to enable future um, upgrades. Mm. And so, you know, people ask, so, hey, the merge is happening. Is Ethereum going to get faster? Like, no. You're like, well, why are you doing it? It's to enable cha future changes that will make it faster, okay, that will increase scalability, that will increase throughput, that will increase um uh, data availability or, or make it simpler, right? And so it's kind of this foundational thing. It's it's very low level in the fabric and the guts of how everything works that sort of sets the stage for a whole bunch of future upgrades to occur. Now, one of the things that seems pretty clear is Ethereum scalability model is modularity moving more and more to L2s. And that's already well underway. So there are a number of significant L2s which are already up and operating like Polygon, mm -hmm. like Optimism, um, like Arbitrum and, and others that basically allow you to uh, use the, the security model of the base layer of Ethereum, but, but transact in other ways that are faster and cheaper and, and have different assumptions associated with them. And so as we look ahead, you're starting to see that future emerge today, that, that these L2s are getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of uh, protocols that are supporting them now. And you can do things on Polygon that you used to only be able to do on Ethereum, but you can do them faster and cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, Polygon's a big partner and customer of ours. And so we're, we're big believers in that ecosystem. And so that's kind of the idea here is uh, the merge sets the stage for some of these future advances to occur. And my belief is it will take some time for those to basically roll out and be present, you know, be, be, obvious to an end user. Now, we foresee wallets that would now inspect transactions 
and notify the user, hey, there's some value that's going to get created by this transaction. Do you want to participate in that? Okay. That requires work at the infrastructure layer and it requires work at the wallet layer. And it's software. It takes time to do. But, you know, in the not too distant future, you might see some radically different experiences when using a wallet that, that makes you a much more native participant in the network and helps you um, realize value in the network that today you don't realize at all that you do some swap on Uniswap and your transaction gets sandwiched. You get less favorable settlement. Someone else profits and you're never the wiser for it. You just notice you had a bunch more slippage than you thought you'd have. Mm. Or you create a transaction that that has a arbitrage opportunity behind it. So it doesn't affect your settlement, but because of your um, trade, somebody else makes a several hundred dollar profit on the arbitrage between exchanges. Like, well, wait, that, that arbitrage opportunity only exists because you initiated the transaction. Doesn't it make sense for you to participate in that? Cause you're the, the, the root of that value. Well, today there's no way to connect those dots. There's no way to string that whole thing together, but, after the merge and some of the modularity that's happening as part of the merge, that becomes very possible, very practical. And so again, you wind up with a very different experience where it feels, um, I don't know, just much more fluid is probably the best way to put it. And so this is what we see happening is uh, um, these sorts of changes to the network. So anyways, yeah. it'll be, uh, we're at the front row of all this. We're really excited to see it all unfold. Maybe, maybe a quick yes or no on this one. I'm curious your, your thought. Do you think that the, the the positive uh the the value add from the merge is or will be shortly current uh baked into the price so do do, uh, do enough people understand the extensive nature of the value added in the merge like what you're describing so as to price accordingly you mean you mean in the short term or the long term uh say any time between now and when it happens the next six months maybe uh, no, yeah. <laughs> I, I personally believe the merge is not really priced in. Mm -hmm. If anything, what's priced in today is risk associated with the merge. And my sense is once the merge happens and it is successful, which I anticipate it being, that it will sort of stabilize the price a little bit. People go, oh, okay, that that risk discount now needs to go away. And then my, my assumption is it will be some period of months afterwards before the, the, the reality dawns like, oh, this was a really major upgrade, that the network is now much more capable and much better positioned to power the future. And, and then, and only then, will um, the value get baked into the price. Um, but, you know, my crystal ball is as hazy yeah. as the next guy's. Mm. Not financial advice. Do your own research, all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm bullish on the long-term prospects of Ethereum, and I'm voting with my feet. I'm, I spend all day, every day working on this stuff. And, and quite frankly, I'm bullish on, on many of the other projects that are surrounding Ethereum as well. And we work collaboratively with many of them. So, uh, you know, we think that the future is very bright for Web3 even though at the moment asset prices are depressed, sure. there's a lot of negative sentiment out there, but you know, the same was true of the internet many times. So I, I tend to be like, oh, yeah, not my first rodeo, if you know what I mean. As long as you understand, or at least have a narrative of why the price would be up or down, then you can, you can maintain the confidence in the underlying uh, trajectory of the technology. Uh, well, a little bit, a little bit pre show, we were talking about ideas that either are contrarian, things you've learned. Uh, are there, are there things that, is there any particular ideas or trends, opinions that consensus that seem to be consensus among the community that you would disagree with or at least push back on? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, I don't know. So it's it's an interesting one. I feel like the the mentality of us versus them mm. and the tribalism is not particularly constructive. I mean, it's part of the ecosystem, of course, but I don't think it serves any of those ecosystems particularly well. Um, I think a lot of that is rooted in you know uh, people and their bags and trying to. Uh, advocate for their personal holdings and they think that their personal holdings will go up in value if they denigrate others. And I just, the nature of innovation is such that that's not constructive at all. Um, so that's just something I don't personally subscribe to. I think that it's not a zero sum game and that there's going to be many winners moving forward. Um, 
Two, I think that the double-edged sword of broadening access to crypto uh, among the broader investor base uh, has both positive and negative co- consequences. So there was a whole period of time where crypto was not correlated with traditional financial markets, and now it's highly correlated with financial markets. Like, why? Well, because all those people who are invested in traditional financial markets are now increasingly invested in crypto markets. And when they get scared or they need liquidity, that impacts the crypto markets as well. I think that's inevitable that, that you know, in general, the, the distinction between a traditional investor and a crypto investor will go away over time. Um, sort of like the distinction between, you know, the internet and not the internet just went away. It's just sort of part of the fabric of our reality. Mm. Um, so I think that's sort of the long-term trend there. But in the near term, it feels like our, the, the crypto markets will be correlated to the broader capital markets and the broader equity markets as well. Um, what else is out there? Uh, I generally feel like you, you follow the software developers, follow the nerds. That's sort of what I've always done. I'm a nerd myself. Um, and, you know, nerds vote with their feet, right? And so uh, the the developer class is a really important class because we live in a software defined world and therefore the experiences we enjoy are the result of software developers making those experiences possible and so if you want to understand the long-term health or viability of any given piece of web3 just pay attention to uh what the developer ecosystem looks like and um you can do that looking at github you can do that looking at other research or you could show up for an ecosystem event and um it's always been pretty interesting for me to sort of uh, you know, drift between different ecosystems, go to their developer focused events, see who shows up, see what the energy level is, see what the discussion is like. And that's what makes me very optimistic about certain ecosystems is that they're incredibly healthy. They've just attracted a lot of talent. There's a lot of really interesting development work going on. There's a lot of optimism about the future. And, and I think more than anything, a lot of commitment that it's people aren't just in it for NGU number go up. They're in it because they believe in the values of the ecosystem and believe on the impact that it can have. So, you know, crypto often gets knocked or at least certain aspects of Web3 for being sort of overly idealistic. I think that's an asset, not a not not, not anything naive or bad that many of the folks who are involved in this ecosystem view this work as so critical to the future development of a, of a positive and productive society. And even though the world is faced with many very real challenges right now, um, now is not a time for despair. Now is a time to get to work, to, to build infrastructure that helps address some of these issues. And it's nowhere more prevalent than here in Web3. So anyways, those are a few top level things on, on that topic. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think the, the over optimism comes at a price of sometimes being uh, like pseudo religious towards a particular direction and therefore aligned to or apt to label other opinions, directions as like evil or, you know, n- certainly not worth doing and, uh, you know, blinds people, I think. So I think optimism is a good direction and then over optimism i think of as this kind of uh trap that humans fall into like this is this is the pathway to utopia you know there, there will be like dow's kind of had that embedded and, and my sentiment is that that's uh that's sort of dulled down a little bit but the initial foray into Dow, same with nfts i mean same with like pretty much everything that's exploded is, is like this is it you finally like humans have discovered this technology now we're good <laughs> No. There's a fine line between belief and zealotry, yeah. right? And so I think sometimes the zealots, by the way, make good headlines. Yeah. You know, they could clickbait right off and drive the, the debate. That's true of, of all markets, all, all systems, not just Web3. Um, but then underneath it all, there is some, some uh, substance is probably the best thing. And, you know, this is just like the Internet took a much longer time than many folks expected and was a, a more circuitous, circuitous journey. I expect the same of Web3. This is a long-term play this is not measured in months or years but maybe you know decades um but that the trajectory seems pretty clear and pretty inevitable and that's sort of my big take is we're all going to live in an on-chain future that much is true uh the only question is what you're going to do about it between now and then Mm. and uh there's a handful of folks today who sort of live in an an on-chain reality and it's a it's a very different um situation and i advise anyone who i talk to to start to get exposure and go hands-on I often say Web3 is a full contact sport. You know, it's not something you do on the sidelines. It's not something you do from the bleachers. You want to be on the field and participating. And the good news is it's trustless, it's permissionless, it's borderless. So anyone can participate at any time. 
Web3 doesn't care where you come from. Web3 doesn't care how old you are. Web3 doesn't care what your educational background is, what your skin color is, what your religious belief is. Um, and, and that's amazing. That's fundamentally different than anything that's come before it. And uh, that, again, is one of the many reasons that I'm optimistic about the future and, and think it's worth pursuing vigorously. If you had to give a grade, a letter grade to our, say, American economic uh, political leaders um, over the last... 30 years, what would you, what would you give them? It would depend on the leader, but uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. There's no doubt. Uh, it's, it's easy to, to, uh, you know, backseat drive on this stuff. I can only imagine how difficult it would be to be in these roles. Um, my sense is there is a, a path of optimism and there is a path of pessimism and uh the, the forces of pessimism seem to be winning out right now. And that's mm. disheartening as a father, as a member of society. Uh, that's a bummer to see, but, but I am ultimately quite optimistic about, you know, our future prospects to address the challenges that we face. It's going to take great leadership. And let's just be honest. I think there's been less than world-class leadership uh, uh, consistently over the course of the past 30 years. Um, but we're entering into a period where we, we need great leadership and we need clarity. And I'm, I'm hopeful, but perhaps uh, uh, not, not naive about what's going to unfold. But my view is worrying about this stuff is sort of like worrying about the weather. There's only so much I can do about it. Um, I would much rather focus on, on building a, a positive path forward here in Web3 and, you know, believing that this sort of stuff is inevitable, even if, you know, there's a lot of skepticism along the way. There was tons of skepticism about the Internet. It was weird. It was strange. It was full of junk. You know, smart, well-paid people, you know, were pointing to the existing models. They didn't really understand the new model. But ultimately, you know, what people think matters less than what the what the substance is, what the reality is. And so I think on a long enough time horizon, the reality wins out. So anyways, yeah. I, I dodged your question a little bit there, but I would give us a C plus, yeah. right? Could have been a whole lot worse. Could have been a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that I've heard people say this, but I think it's so true that uh, crypto does incentivize people to learn uh, economics, how money flows, what, what, what incentives there are in betting, trading, derivatives, uh, futures, shorts, how these things work. Wall Street bets was kind of a, a good example of that where it's like, okay, these people on a random Reddit corner are talking about shorting and hedge funds. And like, I think all of that is, is good energy because it, it's, it's incentivizing competition. Like if Web3 does anything, it opens the playing field for competition and it incentivizes people financially to become knowledgeable and understand the dynamics of projects and the mechanics of uh, how money flows, and then to make strategic investments on that. Whereas I think in the in equities market, the stock market, there's not, it's not as easy to do that. You know, the companies aren't as open. They have quarterly disclosures, but that's usually difficult to entangle what exactly is going on. And so I think it's become kind of stale. And I see this is just crypto is becoming just m much more liquid and open and attractive to people who want to learn and get into uh, investing and learning and contributing. Uh, I agree. I, I, I've said in the past, like, what's the definition of being rich? It's when your money makes money, right? So look, when, when you're rich, right, you don't live off your, your capital base. You have your capital base be performing as investments that generates income and you live off of that and then reinvest and then you get richer, right? Well, there's sort of two big problems with that, of course. Problem one is you need a lot of money to get started, Okay. And problem two is you need access to specialized knowledge and services that most people don't have access to. So it's, it's exclusionary, and, and that's why you have these big disparities that are out there. Well, guess what? You know, Web3 and DeFi eliminates that. So first off, your money can make money at, at the smallest levels, $10, $100, $1,000 of value. You can start earning yield, okay? And, and the techniques you can use to, to do so are open to anybody who is sufficiently curious to figure out how to do it, right? So there's no sort of gated access to this stuff. And for those of us in the West, we enjoy really great access to banking services and really great access to knowledge, but 
for the majority of the world's population, that's not true at all. And so just imagine, you know, young kids in the developing world uh, getting exposure to some of the stuff, being curious, getting going, and with even small amounts of starting capital to begin to, to, to get some yield, to have their money start to make money, to get, you know, increasingly sophisticated on this over the course of their life, because they have, their, you know, uh, they're starting much younger than you or I are, and they're living in areas where even small changes in their level of income can have a massive impact on their quality of life and their productivity, that this is a really big possibility to, to make incredibly positive generational change without having net new growth or production. And this is one of the big sort of underlying secrets, I think, of Web3 is there's huge amounts of value that exist in the existing economy that are just really inefficiently deployed and really inefficient to access. And if all we can do is make the existing stuff we have more efficient and easier to access, we can unlock a huge amount of growth and value and prosperity, right? And that's super attractive. And so um, I think this is really, you know, optimistic around Anyone can participate. You're driven by your own curiosity. You're driven by your own motivation. And not everybody's going to be curious. Not everyone's going to be motivated. But if you are, you're going to have you know, a huge amount of uh, opportunity that you would otherwise never have. Mm -hmm. you'd otherwise, you're born in the wrong country. Sorry. You're, you're of the wrong tribe. Sorry. Yeah. You, you're of the wrong you know, religious sector, whatever. That, that, that just all goes away. And, and again, I just think that's uh, on, the, on the long arc of human history, that's unlike anything that's happened before and ultimately can drive a huge amount of, of positivity in the world and global society. And so we very much like to connect what we do, the code we write every day to some of these bigger uh, societal changes. And this is why we talk about things like equitable access and leveling the playing field and making sure everybody's working the same information so that the future reality is, is – um, uh, a lot more balance than the one that we're we're living in today. And I have just one last comment on this. I feel this often doesn't get said when people talk about equity and shared opportunity. That's all great. I mean that 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 concept and and people often pay lip service to their desire to have the world be more equitable. But what doesn't get put forward, and I think is ultimately internally incredibly motivating, is that you should want that for your own selfish benefit, right? Like I want the world to become equitable. People have access to crypto and investments and ability to make money and contribute, not just because other people benefit. That's nice, but I want it because I want the services. I want the ideas, the products they make. Like we, we, we should all deeply internally without conflict, want people to be able to contribute the skills and the value and their passion and energy to making shit. Because we all want the world with the most beneficial products and services in it that are competitive, but also productive. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I think that's, because people, here's the thing, when there's a lot of talk about equity and uh, inclusion of either different groups within a society or other societies, and, and, and people feel uh, nervous about that because they have a zero sum mentality. Oh, you're going to give, you're going to give the goods to them. That means I'm not going to have it. Right. But, but in reality, this is not zero sum. And it's, it's, it's like, so it, that's the nature of the internet and software, which is like a change almost to how human beings are wired. Right. Like if I were to give you more food in a tribe, Oh, I great. You have food. That's fantastic. High five. But that means I don't have as much food. And so people aren't, built to want to do that. So you almost have to train your mind uh, in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think you said it very well, that this is not a zero sum mentality, right? And that, you know, prosperity begets prosperity in the form of higher standard of living and, and, and higher productivity, right? That once you're able to, to get above a certain level, you can now contribute to society in ways that you couldn't before, and that enriches the society, right? Mm -hmm. It enriches it practically and economically and just sort of production of goods, but also culturally. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, it's, it's easy to break it down into these sort of really coarse things, and it's more like, hey, look, the, the existing system we have is massively productive, but, but massively inefficient. And so if all we do is address some of the inefficiencies and make it easier for, for more people to be, you know, more level, you know, um, equal footing participants in global society, 
we'll have the resources we need to address some of the big vexing challenges, like, I don't know, climate change yeah. or income inequality, right? And so I very much view sort of what we're doing in Web3 as directly connected to some of those macro uh, societal issues. And that if we're really going to get after some of these big things, there's no way to really do it. We're not going to grow our way out of that. We're going to need to innovate our way um, you know, through these challenges. And this is one of the, the leading technologies to do so. So it's fun to, to be a part of all of that. It's humbling to be a part of all of that. And, um, you know, we're one small piece of this broader puzzle, but it's, it's also great to hang out with other people who are building stuff and share similar um, values and have a similar ethos. So anyways, yeah. it's, we're lucky to be doing what we're doing and, and hopefully we can impact positively as many people as possible in the years ahead. Uh, last couple of questions here. How, how, where are you guys on this journey? You've raised, what was the number? Like team size, uh, however you measure revenue sure. or raise money or, or those kind of things. So today we've raised about $19 million total. Um, we're about 35 people um, in, across, you know, the world, uh, you know, in combination. We were, you know, we have a pretty rich product portfolio. You can learn all about it on our website, blocknative.com. And we're lucky to work with many of the top projects, protocols, uh, ecosystems in the space, um, which is great. And, um, you know, Every single day, we're we're interested in engaging with others who are just beginning their journey and, and need help doing so, and those who are well along on their journey and want to get to the sort of the next stage. So, um, you know, we've been at it for a while. Our our technology is deployed by thousands of, of various teams and projects across the ecosystem. We have hundreds of paying customers of what we do, and um, we're regularly blogging about what we do. Or, or, we're trying to educate the ecosystem on pre-chain mempool, how to use it effectively. You can read all about that at our blog. You can follow us on Twitter at at Block Native. And increasingly, I'm trying to do more and more podcasts to um, to help talk about yeah. a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, last thing I want to ask you, is there any people or a book or blog that you've learned personally a lot from that you want to throw out there and share? Oh, so, you know, one of my sort of the best management books out there, I think, is an, a, an oldie called uh, The Innovator's Solution. It's Clayton Christensen, who was a professor at HBS. His probably most famous book is Innovator's Dilemma, but he just sort of set up the problem, and then he wrote Innovator's Solution, which contains all of Innovator's Dilemma and sort of presents how to do it. I think a lot about that type of mm. stuff. Um, uh, in the ecosystem, I think you can't ignore the value of crypto Twitter as long as you're following the right sort of people, and it's a really – a critical resource for everybody. And that's why we participate um, in Twitter uh, for podcasts. In addition to your own, of course, I'm a big fan of the breakdown from Nathaniel Whittemore, mm -hmm. um, a daily podcast that's sort of 15 minutes long that I, I get a lot of value out of. Um, and I get a lot of value out of conferences. Oh my gosh. The, the ETH global events, um, uh, we were just at Permissionless in, in uh, Florida, which was great. We participated in Consensus. We'll be at ETHCC coming up. Um, there really is no uh, replacement for the in-person interaction with members of the ecosystem. If you're really interested in Web3 and you've not been to one of these events, I really encourage you to check it out. It's it's sort of unlike anything you've ever done before. These are not trade shows. Um, they're something in, uh, else entirely, and, and they're pretty fantastic. And then, of course, we try to contribute. You know, uh, our blog, our Twitter feed, um, our ecosystem, we're trying to not just learn, but we're also trying to teach in the areas that we have something to contribute. I love it, Matt. Thanks for coming on today, and congrats on all the progress. Appreciate it. You bet. My pleasure, Mike. And uh, I appreciate everybody tuning in. And, and if you want to hear from me, I'm at M Cutler, M-C-U-T-L-E-R on Twitter. My DMs are open and uh, we'll see everybody out there. Okay. Thank you, sir.